Okay, so we're on a part two now of uh, the B system. We kind of look at the personalities involved uh, last time. And this time we're going to look more at where the Antichrist, where the beast sits in the world as far as world government, world religion, all that kind of thing. And uh, so there's, you've probably heard it all, all kinds of different views. And as we said last week, there, with interpretations of the beast and all that kind of stuff, it's just, you know, the colors of the rainbow, it's, it's myriad. So if you have your Bible, you'll want to get in there into Revelation 13, but I'm not going to promise that we're staying camped out there tonight. In fact, I can promise you that we're not. This little chart shows you kind of where we are in the timeline. It's, a, it's another big parenthetical. Um, again, you see the first half. We've already covered the first half in the earlier chapters. That's done. Everything else is setting up for the Great Tribulation. It's, it's kicking all of this off. And uh, it's already started when you get into, for instance, the narrative of chapter 11, where we have the two witnesses, and then uh, there's been war in heaven in chapter 12. So between those chapters, we had Satan and his demons kicked down to the earth once and for all. So what a mess that is upon the earth, right? I don't know what all the demons are doing at this time. It can't be pretty. But we know Satan comes down and enters the uh, man of perdition, the man of sin that we call Antichrist. Um, no doubt that first three and a half years, uh, the Antichrist is possessed, even if not by Satan, by a chief prince, chief demon, perhaps several. And then by the time we get into the middle, in chapter 12, we see where he's been kicked down. And now we have what I'm just kind of calling to make that distinction because now we've got the dragon, Satan himself, inside the Antichrist. We have what I've been calling the Antichrist beast, the beast. And uh, this is where things are, are really ugly and, he, and he's setting things up. So we're getting acquainted with who all they are, where they came from. We went over last week whether uh, the Antichrist could possibly be a Gentile. And again, we went over where it's very popular today to believe that the Antichrist might be a Muslim. Then we read um, email and some articles and things from actual rabbis living there and telling you who they're looking for. They're looking for someone of the line of David, tribe of Judah. And they say that's Jewish law. So there, there's that to contend with. And then some scriptures that indicate probably that he's a Jew or at least part Jew. So now we're looking at things like where he rises up out of and where he rules and where his base of operations will be and how far his reach is upon the earth, all those kinds of things. But here you see where that indicates where we're a parenthetical. If you... Um, if you look at chapter, let me see if I can, I'm going about half blind here, if I can make this larger, my little screen here. We saw where the uh, trumpet, the last trumpet, the seventh angel blows his trumpet, and then there were at that point, uh, thunders and lightnings upon are in heaven, and we have this whole kickoff preamble to the bowl judgments because the tr seventh trumpet really does hearken the bowls, and we have the bowls dumping out upon the earth, right? So we got all this period in between, and then you finally get into chapter 15. Um, let's, let's go ahead and look at chapter 15 real quick. So it's, it's after, after the chapter we're at here, but see, we're still in the prelude to the bowls. 
So this indicates chapters 12 to 14 are all parenthetical, and then chapter 15 is a prelude to the bowls. So we get to well, the whole thing. Chapter 15 says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over his, the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of gold, they sing the song of Moses, the servant, of God and the song of the Lamb, and then they sing this great song. And then verse 5, after these things I look, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. So there's a temple in heaven. And out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. So we have them, not until chapter 15, actually getting into pouring out the, uh, the seven bowls. So this is just to verify, because you'll be challenged with all the different perspectives on how to read Revelation, that no, this is stuff, this is going on now, this is you know, somewhere in the timeline. Well, really, it is, but you know, you're, you're focusing on a narrow section. And let me bring this up here for everybody to see. You're, you're dealing with a narrow section here. Um, just past the middle where, on this chart it's past the middle, but it shows you where everything is setting up. The stage is being set up for the bold judgments. Um, there might be a, a little bit of a pause while some of this stuff's going on, but, you know, the bowls as far as that goes. But meanwhile, the Antichrist is setting things up and the false prophet's setting things up, and that's the kind of things we're looking at. So, without further ado... You know, I wanted to also look at, again, by, just by way of review, the word tribulation comes from the Greek word philipsis, meaning affliction and distress. To go over some of the names of this time again, um, Jacob's trouble or distress, and that's in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, Daniel's 70th week, um, in the same same passage, a time of trouble or distress, Daniel 12, 1. The great day, the one of their wrath, Daniel 6, 17. The hour of testing, which shall try the whole earth, Revelation 3, 10. The indignation in Daniel 26, 26. Tribulation and the great tribulation was spoken of in, in the all of that discourse, Matthew 24, Mark 13. You also have uh, Revelation 17, it's worded that way. Uh, also, you have the day of the Lord 20 times in, in the Old Testament, three times in the New. So you can look at Joel 115, Joel 2 1, 1 Thessalonians 5 2. So all these are also known as the day of the Lord. Um, the day of God in 2 Peter 3.12, the day of the Lord's wrath, Zephaniah 1.18, the day of darkness in Joel 2.2, 2 and Zephaniah 1.15. So I hope you all are, are being blessed by learning some of this stuff. Remember, this is, Revelation is the one book in the Bible that comes with a special promise of a blessing for those who read it and, and um, follow it for those who try to understand it and obey it and that kind of thing. So it's really awesome. Remember, too, we covered Revelation 1.19, gave us the outline for the book where Jesus told John in, in this outline in um, Revelation 1.19, the exact wording in the New King James, James anyway, King, King Jimmy, says, um, write the things which you have seen and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. That's the outline for the whole book, Revelation 119. So that's a key verse to remember. And that will save a lot of confusion because some belief systems will kind of stray outside of even that outline. 
and they'll wander all over the place. So let's just kind of review a little bit. Um, like I said, we're going to kind of glide right over some of the, the stuff with, with the beast that we looked at last week. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but obviously there is overlap. So beginning with verse 1, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous name on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and authority. So this beast rising out of the sea is described differently than in chapter 11. There's, there's a beast that is sent out of a bottomless pit. And uh, so who's the beast that comes and goes out of the bottomless pit? You know, it, that's the, the dragon. But this one that comes out of the sea, remember a sea is a, a great number of people. Some people will try to look in particular and say, well, the sea is different from the people of Israel, so the sea means Gentile, so he comes out of the Gentile nations. Well, um, sea is emblematic very often of just masses, large numbers of people, so we can't just say that it's only the Gentiles. So the Antichrist coming out of Gentile nations, I think, I hope we dispelled a lot of that notion uh, last week. Um, the one out of the pit also ascends. He ascends in the present tense, not in the past. It means that this is what he does. It's his practice. So it could be that the beast rising out of the bottom of his pit, Satan. Um, so he possesses the beast rising out of the sea um, of many people and nations, now in command of many nations. So that the beast is described as coming out of the sea suggests large, countless numbers. Um, note the realm of authority is over kings and kingdoms on the earth. And yet, in verse 2, the dragon gave him his power. So his throne and great authority clearly indicating that there are um, two distinct entities going on here. So you've got the beast himself who has this power and this authority and who's reigning, but he gets his authority from somewhere else, and that's the dragon, the Antichrist, or the, the uh, Satan himself, who makes him the Antichrist beast. Um, we're going to look at the, the ten nations, and there's, there are different perspectives on this. But first, let's look at these some of these, these animals here, and we, we covered this last week. The beast I saw was like a leopard. leopard. Remember, these are similes. Like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth were like a lion's mouth. And to the to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. In Daniel seven, we we have this. historically Daniel seven is a metaphor for swift Alexander the Great of Greece. It's clear that he was possessed, and his ability to move through the um, known world at the time, known civilized world at the time was just remarkable. And um, at a very young age, just in his 30s, he had conquered the whole world. So it's, it's dramatic. So it says that this one beast, the Antichrist beast, is like this, but he's not just like this. He's also like the bear. So he's got bear feet. Nothing wrong with bear feet. Uh, for that is uh, stands for the the fierce strength of Palestine, and in those days among the ancient Medo-Persian Empire, Iraq and Iran, and they had great power in those days. The lion was a metaphor for the Babylonian Empire, and thus he arrogantly speaks, which is the root of also of all false religion from the very beginning. So he's not like any one of these. Notice what John is doing here. The picture that's being painted is that this one, this one dude is like all of these. So fierce, quick, mouth like a lion, um, and speaks arrogantly. So that's part of the reason why I'm bringing these up. Um, not that he's necessarily going to come out of those nations. I want to point those out, or any one of those nations. It's saying that he's like these guys. So this is why 
this is kind of like uh, Gog and Magog, and we'll see that when we look at some of these nations too. Remember, we, we looked at Gog and Magog, and what happened with Gog and Magog uh, in Ezekiel 38? Do you remember what happened to Gog? Didn't he die on the mountains of outside of Israel? And yet in Revelation 20, we have where after a thousand years, Satan's loosed, right? Re look at Revelation 20, verse 7. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth. That doesn't mean the earth is square. Yeah, from north, east, west, and, west, and south, right? Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. So what he's saying is, not that God's been resurrected, but it, he's like Gog in the sense that Gog and a bunch of, a coalition of nations all came against Jerusalem. So it's like that. So when you say he's like a bear, like this leopard, and like the lion, and it's the same thing as we have in Revelation 20, like Gog and Magog, Although the word like isn't used, but clearly God's been dead now for well over a thousand years by the time you get to this passage in Revelation 20. So um, they're similar in that respect. So keep that in mind as we look at some of these nations, because I think there's more than meets the eye here. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority verse 5, I'm sorry, to continue for 42 months. How long, how long is that? 42 months. Three and a half years. Three and a half years. So, but wait, how long has the Antichrist been around? Three and a half years. He's already, <laughs> he's already been around for three and a half years. So now he's got this authority to, to continue for 42 months. Well, what that means is there's a transition going on here. This beast is separate from just the Antichrist guy, the man of sin. So now he's possessed by Satan. Now he's, he's given authority to continue for 42 months. Where does, where does he get this authority to, to continue for 42 months? Oh, my God. Yeah, absolutely. God. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. He's cursing everything associated with God in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And we discussed last week about the difference between the church and the tribulation saints because different from what we were looking at last week, what I wanted to highlight is, and authority was given him over just Europe, how about the, you know, the Ten Nations, the Ten Nation Confederacy? How about over uh, just Babylon? No, it's over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So we see here globalism is what's going on. So is it just over seven hills in a certain country or at a certain so location? You can see now why he was given authority over all the tribes, tongues, and nation, while the very, he's over this world, right? Satan has dominion over this world, and that's why every government and every outlying worldly system is trying to make it a one world. You can see this globalism coming together right now, can't you? Unless you've yeah. got your head in the sand. Absolutely. He is the prince of the power of the air, right? Yeah. He's also called the god of this age. So he, he's being restrained at this time, our, our time, I mean, not this time here, he's restrained now. Um, even here, he's restrained a, a little bit, somewhat, um, but not much. He can't touch the people in Israel. Right, yeah. So, so again, we had, we had this, this little debate, um, not among us here that I've heard so far, but I mean, we didn't really discuss it much about the head wound, whether it means just a nation, a nation that was destroyed and brought back. And, and some people believe that, or whether it's also a man. And it's, I said it's possible, a very good possibility that it's both. 
but um, look, look, look down at um, look at Revelation Revelation seventeen. Um, look at verse nine, ten, and eleven, just to confirm that strictly speaking, we we looked at that Old Testament passage about the idle shepherd or the wicked shepherd and and blind in one eye and his arm gets withered and all this kind of stuff. Revelation 17, verse 9 says, Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And we know this is global, right? So I'm suggesting possibly, and I kind of raise the notion, uh, I kind of was at the same time as the idea reared up in uh, Jaden's brain, that the continents, really there's seven continents, which are kind of hills that stick up out of the water, right? Um, so I'm thinking seven mountains might not be um, a particular city. In fact, I had some fun here. I downloaded, if you go to Wikipedia online and you look at list of cities claimed to be built on seven hills, there's something like 94 of them. So, you know, if, if you're going to say, well, it's literal seven hills and just hills in, a, in just a city at a certain location. You know, have fun with that. It's, among them, though, are, are uh, for instance, Jerusalem is a city on seven hills. Mount Scopus, Mount Olivet, uh, the Mount of Corruption, um, that's part of the old city, Mount Ophel, original Mount Zion, the new Mount Zion, and the hill in which the Antonia Fortress was built, which the Antonia Fortress is what we call the Temple Mount. That's where the fortress was. Also, uh, Athens, Greece, Seven Hills. Moscow, Russia, did you know that was one too? That's one, Seven Hills. And Rome, Italy is the one everybody usually runs to. Yeah, so if you want to look at this, you want, there's 94 of those puppies. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and pass it around. <laughs> kind of interesting, but uh, so I don't know. I kind of like the idea since we we're talking globalism here that Seven Hills are you know, the seven continents in the world. Would John and those folks back then have known that there are seven continents? Probably not. If God told them, you know, seven hills or seven mountains or something like that, he said, oh, well, okay, I wonder which seven. But, you know, comprehending that's a different kind. So that's kind of my notion here. And that's my notion in approaching these, these countries. And I'll explain why. So anyway, let's continue to read in Revelation 17. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings, and we will discuss these. Uh, five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. That, that passage there, that little bit there is talking about the Antichrist when he comes. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. So we're going to dissect that passage just a little bit more. I mean, let me, uh, there's something else I want to read in there too that I, I'm deviating from my notes. Be afraid. Where should we be at right now? Well, I was looking at Revelation 17 real quick. We're not skipping all those chapters. Well, see, verse 12, if I were to keep going, the ten horns which you saw are the ten kings and have received no kingdom as yet. So there's ten kings going to come, and they're going to be in a kingdom. So it's not, not kingdoms necessarily that exist right now, but they receive authority for one hour, in other words, a short time, as kings with the beast. So he, these are co-rulers, co-regents, whatever. They're going to be ruling underneath the authority of the beast. Um. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, right? When, when, is, when do we see Lord of Lords and King of Kings? Second coming, right? And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So, okay. So... We can go back to 13 now. I just wanted to point that out because of the global type nature of his rule and the reach of his rule. That's what I want to kind of get across here. 
So you'll hear different opinions on this. Here's my radical proposition, and I've more than hinted on it. A radical proposition, the nations, kingdoms, horns, um, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, statue or image, uh, the three animal visages, the seven hills, the seven heads, they're all about the nature of the beast's reach and rule. It is not about a specific location. Why? Because the beast system will be global. I haven't really heard, everybody will agree that the beast system is global, but I haven't heard anybody, I mean, they usually try to nail down a specific location of where these countries and nations are out of. But I think you can look at those, and yes, it's correct, and you can look at the legs of iron and things like this that Daniel had and say, uh, Daniel saw this um, big statue, if you want to call it that, with the legs of iron. And, so, and clearly that's Rome, and, and he's looking historically at some things that happened. But remember, like the three animals, um, you know, where it's like a leopard, like a bear, and like a lion, specific countries in the past, and he's like all three of them in his swiftness, in his power, and his authority, and his reach. And uh, so I, th I think similar here when we're looking at um, these different historical nations. So, so I think, I, think I, I like your radical proposition because I know Mislow says that part of the blessing in understanding Revelation is that you truly have to have grasp on the whole Bible. You have to go back and look and see, like, you know, that cool thing about the wings of the eagles. Well, that was back in Exodus. So, so really understand... Yes, so for God to put these, for lack of a better word, Easter eggs all throughout the Easter. Old Testament and the New Testament <clears throat> to really get across how big this is going to be, you know, this is the end and whatnot. Um, I like it. Good. Thanks. Let's see if you still like it by the time we're done here. Well, I like it right here now. Yeah. So. yeah all right. Um, so Bible teachers and students will get all wrapped up in whether the beast comes from Rome or from ancient Babylon, or whether Europe or the United States even is um, Babylon, or United Nations is the new Babylon, um, and Antichrist will come from and reign in all those regions. So he'll be reigning in all of that. So the more I read, the more I see these descriptions as types, just as Gog and Magog are kind of given to us as a type an analogy that's used later on in Revelation 20, even though Gog's been dead for over a thousand years. So Daniel's pre-written history was a disclosure to Daniel, a specific disclosure for the Jews about actual historical events that would one day happen. It's just true. Uh, all those kingdoms and enslavements of Israel did happen similarly. The final earthly iron mixed kingdoms of ten toes and the dragon's ten horns, that'll happen in the future. We're told for Daniel that it'll, that'll happen in the future. And we're also told about the dragon's ten horns, that it's going to be in the future. So the beast will reign over that um, in whatever composition it is just prior to his dominance over the whole earth. Um, all of it. So let, anyway, let's take a look. Let's pick up Revelation 13, verse 8, again to show the globalism. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Now, who is everyone whose name is not in the book of life? Yeah, it's all the unbelievers. So we're looking at global. We're looking all over the earth, all the unbelievers. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Verse 10, if anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints. Here is a little something I dragged together. People have... Second, yes, you, that would be horrific to be a new believer, yeah. Okay, yes. a new believer, like not even it, it immediately have to go through that. 
Yeah. Those poor people, I mean, the Holy Spirit will be with them and all, but to have to then turn around and try to figure this all out, try to find somebody, up, maybe like, you know, a pastor who wasn't saved, but at least knows, or a rabbi that's a messianic, or just try to find someone to help you get through it all. Yeah. Those can be horrible, but at the same time, it's beautiful that this is more of God's mercy. How so? God could pull the plug, and then there's the rapture, and no more chances. So, from that perspective, people have been, you know, gee, my Aunt Nancy kept telling me about Jesus and trying to drag me to church, and I don't have time for those church people or whatever. Or, um, you know, that guy at work, Bob at work, keeps telling me about, you know, and telling me I should live this way and that way. Then finally, the rapture happens and some of these events start happening and you got the 144,000 witnesses all over the earth. And you see these uh, cataclysmic events with all the asteroids falling on the earth and the earth it, no and no rain for long periods of time and fire great quakes and then it's really clear to those who have eyes to see to those who the holy spirit's in, enlightening um that hey th these are really are those events in the bible while wow, that bible stuff is true i blew it well, thank God for his mercy because now I have another chance. I have another chance. I might, I might get killed. I might find myself by profession an asteroid catcher and <laughs> won't be around very long, or I might be beheaded. Uh, who knows what might happen, but praise God I get this chance. So here we've got two chapters in, in, in uh, Daniel. And... Uh, Daniel is another book that we, we really should at some time uh, visit. If you haven't visited it in a while, we need to revisit. But the vision, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, this, isn't it interesting that God would give a vision to an unbeliever? Um, he's got his reasons for doing that and to put Daniel in an important place for a season and so forth, not unlike Joseph. And Pharaoh getting um, some dreams and, and Joseph having to interpret them. So the vision that Daniel's given are of these natures, of, the, of these nations, I'm sorry. The vision that Daniel is given is of these nations. The head of gold is Babylon where Nebuchadnezzar was. The chief kingdom, I mean, um, but also the wickedness that's come out of Babylon from the beginning of time can't be ignored. Uh, silver represented Persia, and the two arms represented the Medo-Persian Empire. The bronze was Greece, and then the legs of iron was Rome. And then here's an interesting thing that happened. So this, this did happen historically, right? There's, in fact, it's so clear, it's so sharp, and in Daniel chapter 7, the, the visions there of um, these animals in... Uh, given in Daniel 7 for the same nations is so clear, so indisputable what it's, he's talking about that unbelieving historians will argue and say, no, this stuff could not have been written by Daniel. It was added by somebody else later or Daniel was written much later than what they said because there's no way it could be this clear, this exact, this precise. But it was. So then we have the two legs of iron in Daniel chapter 2, and, and it's it's Rome. So you see that going on. So see how this is all kind of morphing, and you see this globalism happening, and you can kind of see the creep. The creep is what we're looking for going on in everything. We're seeing it with the financial systems, what's going on, and the number of the beast, and nothing out here right now is the number of the beast, because as we discussed last week, and we'll look at it again here, the number of the beast is not your number. It's not my number. It's not my personal data, my personal information. It's not about a chip with your personal information on there. It'll morph in a way that it'll become, that stuff will morph in a way that will become useful for the Antichrist, especially tracking. Um, back when I was 
um, in management for one of the one of the Fortune 100 retailers. They were experimenting with and looking at RFID chips, which at the time were roughly uh, there was something smaller than a grain of sand. And they're talking about this will be great for inventory, you know. And they had some pilot stores that they were trying this out. So every pack of cigarette, um, every package of gum, clothing would have somewhere in the hem in the seam, which right now, whatever you're wearing, it's got an RFID chip. Not as like a, 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 a product type identifier. In other words, every box of Cheerios has the same UPC barcode on it, right? RFID chip is every box has its own unique identifier. Every blouse, every shirt, every shoe has its own identifier, every pair of shoes. Okay, so they provide power passively. When they're scanned, power enough will um, pulse out of them, if I can put it that way, where they, they can read the identifier. So if they got a scanner, they can come by your house. Uh, Possibly even through GPS systems, satellite systems, they can tell where everything's at. So they, we know with credit cards plus what you buy, they're tracking everything that you buy and they're targeting you for ads, right? We know they're even doing that with your cell phones. You start talking about work boots, mentioning work boots, uh-oh. I'm saying work boots and some of y'all have your phones sitting around. I know I do. Pretty soon you'll start getting work boot ads because they're hearing my voice right now. And Google will get it and everything else will get it. And next thing you know, through the smart systems, it says, hey, they're talking about work boots an awful lot in that household. Let's send them ads about work boots. And this is what goes on. It's still kind of a dumb system because you'll go on there and you'll be looking for a bathtub. How many bathtubs do you need? You'll be looking for a bathtub. You'll find how much are bathtubs at Lowe's. Ah, oh, that's a good price. Let's go buy one. You go buy the bathtub and you install it. And two weeks later, you're still getting ads for bathtubs. And said, I've already got my bathtub. Go away. So it's not a very smart system yet. But, you know, they'll get it dialed in. And they'll be tracking everybody. So no one can buy or sell or do anything without having this identifier. What if, what if your ability to spend now is tied to these RFID chips and the things that you get? You don't have to swipe a card even necessarily walking out of the store. The items that you have, if it's never been scanned before or um, you know, you've got it in your shopping cart or whatever, it automatically debits your account. And it can track exactly who's got what and who's buying what and who's where. And that's how no one can buy or sell. So at some point, you'll have to buy your stuff secondhand and get all your clothes at a thrift store because then they don't know who's got it. But, you know, at some point, they'll have your, this is how they would, always have your name and your ID is not just necessarily with your credit card, but now tied to you because now you've got this system from Antichrist where it's his number, his name tied to your right hand or forehead that also identifies with you. So that's how something like that would happen. So it's, it's very creepy. So we see the Roman Empire, we see the mixed things that's happened, and then you get the toes and you have the final variant is is uh, comes out of the Roman Empire in some weird mixed fashion that is miry and unstable. So it's iron, like it's Rome, but then it's also clay. So it's an unstable mixed system and it speaks to exactly, it reinforces what I'm trying to say that it's global, so it's, it's a big mucky mess of, of everything. It's not just Rome. Um, and so as this earthly kingdom has reached over the whole earth, um, it'll either be strictly Rome or strictly Babylonian or strictly Grecian or strictly Middle Eastern, like this statue has. This statue is for Israel to say, here's where your future is going. Um, but then we get the ten toes, and this is the part that really is meant for us. It's meant for Israel to know, to know about because the, the tribulation period is about Israel, right? We, as the saints alive, now have access to it. We see that that's in the future of the world too, and thankfully we'll be gone from that. So, yes, all these places did exist, but this is all to let us know that there's something really weird going to happen in the future, and that's the feet of iron and, and clay. And also, you have um, the 
the iron also in the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. It can be debated whether the teeth are, you know, he's, I'm sure he doesn't have just 10 teeth. <laughs> so I think iron teeth means Rome, he's got the power of Rome, the bite of Rome. Rome was a killing machine. I think that might be what it's trying to say, is that type of a thing. Just like Rome was historically. Everybody knows what Rome did to Jerusalem, right? So this new Babylon, this new Rome, this variety on the earth, um, it'll be all-inclusive. Um, so it'll be the final government system, the final monetary system, military system, including the Americas and Asia, Eastern Europe, Africa, Australia, Middle East, everywhere. Except Daniel 11, remember, when you look at that passage, tells us that there's a portion in the old territory of, of modern, what's now modern Jordan, that um, in, the, in the Petra area, there's this portion of modern Jordan that won't be touched by, it'll be under God's protection. Just like the land of Goshen from Exodus. Here is a chart. Speaking of um, seven heads and ten horns, you can find the reference in this as we have it here, Daniel 7.20. Also, the seven heads, ten horns, Revelation 12, 3, and also Revelation 17, 10, because we were just looking at that. But it says there are also seven kings. So we look at that. That's like the seven heads, right? Five have fallen. And historically, this did happen. Egypt, Assyria. Babylon, Persia, and Greece. One is, and at John's time, this is one perspective now. You tell me if you agree with it or not. One is, and that was Rome at the time, and the other has not yet come. That's Rome part two. Rome the sequel, right? And that's in the future. This is all from Revelation 17 that we just looked at. And when he comes, he must continue a short time, or one hour, as some translations say, for one hour. The beast that was and is not, some will say, well, that's Assyria, because it was, but, you know, it's not a kingdom anymore. All these other, whether it's Egypt, Babylon was, is uh, where we we're looking at part of, a, part of Iran, and Iraq, Persia is Iran, Greece those have all come back and, and back in full strength. So the beast that was and is not, a lot will say that's the Assyrian kingdom. Um, Micah 5, 5 and 6 is himself also the eighth. And they say that's the same as the little horn in Daniel 7 to 8. The Antichrist is called the Assyrian. We'll look at those kingdoms and we'll look at the overlap of them. We'll see why it says this. And is of the seven and is going to perdition. We see Revelation 20 is when he's going to perdition, right? Eventually. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. And then this here, and the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, so that means an eleventh horn, before which three fell. So that's how you end up with seven, is because you're going to have the Antichrist beast and three other kingdoms falling down, three kings falling. I'm sure that will mean more to those people alive at the time than it means to us now because everybody now is just trying to guess what does this mean and who are these kingdoms and so forth. But again, as, as we looked at, at uh, how much we get bogged down with looking at nations and stuff and who, are, who is Gog and who's Magog and who's these nations. Now, is, that, is that like um, we're seeing the birth pains of it? 
so we're starting to see all this stuff and working on Ukraine and, mm -hmm. and, and Ezekiel period, they're going to attack Russia and some of the countries are going to fall, they're going to come back together as, a, so out of all of that that's going to happen then different kingdoms. No, the, the borders will move and things will shift. I remember it was really popular in the 70s and uh, people getting excited about the European Union and going, oh no, a 10 nation confederacy and they were looking at this and then they had 10 nations. And then they had 11, 12, 13, 14. Uh, so what we're seeing is, like you said, birth pangs. We are seeing um, the struggle, the formation, how things will fall together and eventually become morph into something completely so different. So we can almost say like the iron, we're not going to see it yet, but almost like the iron and the clay, things are starting to come together and just mash. And yeah. so we'll be gone, but they'll have to deal with that. Yeah, they will. Okay. So there are 10 rulers or horns at that time who serve with the beast, an 11th horn. There's seven kingdoms. Um, and whether they each one of, if it's continents, for instance, if each continent's his own kingdom and he's got a ruler over some of those different areas. Um, and with Assyria, remember Nimrod is who came out of Babylon and we know what a train wreck he was. Um, Revelant, uh, Daniel 7.20 says, And the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn, Daniel 7.21, was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. So we are speaking of the same era here. Until the Ancient of Days came and it, a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the same came, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Verse 23, thus he said, the fourth, fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it to pieces. Then the torn, ten horns, boy, I'm merging my words here, speaking of merging. The ten horns are ten kings, verse 24, who shall rise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them, again the beast, and he shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings, and shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints, of the Most High, and shall intend to change the times and laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. She is? And three and a half years. Three and a half years. So that time, he, he changing the times and the laws, that he's going to go in and, and say no more sacrifices. No That's part of it, but I think there's a lot of laws that are going to change that yeah. are going to be focused on him. But yeah, that, that would be among them, yeah. yeah. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people. The saints of the Most High, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Well, part of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, we see this great, you know, statue or whatever, and that's standing on the feet of clay. What takes it down? A big rock. Big rock. This big rock falls and it busts it to pieces and it grows and expands and becomes a mountain. That covers the whole earth, and that's Jesus Christ, right? That's the, the true Messiah. That, that's what I'm looking forward to. So here's a, a, a chart looking at that kind of perspective, too. It's interesting. Stay in the book of Revelation. Everybody will run to Rome and revise Roman Empire, and we'll be looking at the European Union and all of that. And there are some great arguments, too, that have been presented um, that show really how Babylon... And culture 
and in so many different ways has now shifted to the West. And even over here in the United States, uh, you know, I mean, you've got, let me flash real quick over here as, as an example, you know. So you got the United Nations type stuff going on, and that looks just like Daniel's Beast. Um, and you've probably seen that pop up in the news recently. But culturally, um, we've seen so much of what's um, going on in the Western world as reminiscent of old Babylon. But mostly, in, by mention, Rome, as far as the iron and the iron teeth and so forth, we got Daniel 2, as we saw, and Daniel 7. I also have that, that iron teeth also, in, maybe in uh, Daniel chapter 6. Um, and Babylon is in Daniel 6. And you have Babylon mentioned in Revelation 14 and chapters 16 to 19. Yet, language indicates that the final evil earthly kingdom is about the entire earth. Let's look at some passages here. I'm gonna I'm gonna fling out some passages, and I I need uh, some volunteers. Laura, <clears throat> I'll grab I'll grab Isaiah. Can somebody grab Daniel seven twenty three? Daniel. Now, whoever grabs some Revelation ones are going to be totally cheating because those are all real close together. And some. You're going to grab Luke 21? Okay. So uh, Isaiah 14, 26. This is the purpose that is purposed against the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations. So you look at Assyria destroyed and you look at, um, at that time about the destruction of Assyria. He starts going into the type of language that it is. Uh, judgment of God, day of the Lord type of language, and this is what he's talking about is the whole earth. Who's got, uh, okay, I got Isaiah 28. Let me flip over a couple pages. And it's the same type of thing talking about that time. Isaiah 28, 22. Now therefore do not be mockers, lest your bonds be made strong, for I have heard from the Lord of hosts a destruction determined even upon the whole earth. Okay, so now who's got Daniel 7.23? Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. The whole earth. Break, who's got Luke 21.35? For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Everybody's. Luke three ten. Or I'm sorry. Oh, I meant Revelation three ten. Because you have kept my command and and to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. Revelation twelve verses nine and twelve. Anybody got that? dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and ye who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in a great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. Yep. Revelation 13, we've got one, two, three, four verses there. Uh, verse 8, or verse 3, verse 8, 12, and 14. I, I've got three ready. You got Revelation 13, 3? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. All the world marveled. In verse 8, what does that say? Jaden? All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. All the world again. In the verse 12 and 14. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and causes the earth and those who dwell on it to worship the first beast, 
whose deadly wounds heal. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and life. So the earth dwellers, you know, that's a specific name, a specific term, mostly about the unbelievers upon the earth at that time. Who's got 1614? I have it ready. Okay. For they, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Then one more. Who's got Revelation 18, 9? The kings of the earth are commanded fornication and live luxuriously with her, will weep and lament, lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. The kings of the earth will lament over her. That's the kings of the earth. That's the whole globe, the whole big ball, right? So is that... Is that kind of clear what, you know, see where I'm heading with that, how it's not just localized. And we can argue about where he comes from and all this kind of stuff. And he's called the Assyrian. But here's the thing with him being called the Assyrian and his reach and all this kind of stuff. Here are some of those ancient territories. I am going to expand this here. Um, the red oval is Israel, and you can see where Israel is in the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Greco-Macedonian Empire, and also in the Roman Empire. They all, there's a lot of overlap there, right? So in that overlap, you can see maybe what, what uh, John is communicating or what's being communicated to John in these um, visions about these animals and these beasts. So it's no one particular empire, but each of these empires have a unique scope of evil about them. They have a unique reach, unique power, unique characteristics about them. And just as we looked at those animals and saw how you had these three different animals, the leopard, the bear, and the lion with wings like an eagle and so forth. Um, they had these different characteristics, but the, the point of pointing them out was to say that this guy is like that. He's, he's got these characteristics. We see the globalism going on. So the globalism is like the Roman Empire, fierce, just devouring, consuming everything, like Babylon and its corruption and um, the moral decay and so forth like Greece, like Alexander the Great, who quickly, swiftly took over everything. So that kind of thing. And I, I think that's what we're looking at when we're looking at the naming of these, these different countries. And I think um, he's called the Assyrian. It could be just simply for that, for that kind of reason, but um, it could be too. Uh, I don't have a problem believing that the Assyrian means that when the Antichrist comes up, he's born somewhere in that old Assyrian Empire, uh, in those territories, in those boundaries. He, so he could be a Jew coming out of Assyria. Does this make sense? Any questions so far? We're almost done here. Okay. And then we have, um, back in chapter 13, the false prophet. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb. So again, it's emulating like a type of Christ. Christ as the lamb, right? And it spoke like a dragon. But what came out of its mouth was satanic, demonic. We know preachers like that today, correct? Yeah. Yes. It exercises all authority of the first beast in its presence, and it, it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs, performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. So it's going to have miracles that it's going to be able to do. So miracles themselves are not necessarily a sign of somebody being godly or from heaven, right? We saw that with the, the magicians in Pharaoh's court during the time of, of uh, 
Moses, they were able to emulate um, true miracles. Uh, and by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives who? Those who dwell on the earth, again, the earth dwellers, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Now let's look at those, there's two phrases there again that tell us that this beast that's wounded, the wound is not just a nation or a country. It could refer also to one that died and is going to come back, be revived and come back. But this is, to me, in my mind, definitely a person, the Antichrist beast himself. Not just because of the, the passage in the Old Testament about the idle shepherd or the worthless shepherd, but look again at verse 12. It exercises all authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship who? The first beast, okay, the first beast is not an animal, right? It's not one of the nations. It's talking now about a person. Worship the first beast who what? Whose mortal wound was healed. And then that last verse we just read, um, in verse 14, and by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives the earth dwellers again, telling them to make an image for the beast who what? The beast who what? was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So that's not, to me, talking about a nation in those specific passages. I think we're talking about a person. So here, here's the other question, too. You know, again, with respect to whether the mortal wound is about a man or a nation. Note that the false prophet makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound is healed. Question, do we ever read of this time, really, I think maybe of any time in the Bible, where a people worshipped a nation. So here, this is a second argument pointing to this is a person, not a nation. Because when do we ever have nation worship? And I can't think of one. If you think of one, you let me know, but I cannot think of one. Therefore, although Rome, for example, fell and will be revived after fashion, this is about the first beast, and uh, who's a man, we know as Antichrist, and yet becomes you know, the the dragon um, ends up possessing them. The nations are never indicated as receiving worship. Well, see, and, and if you look after it's saved, wounded by the sword and lived, the next very word is he. He. I've never seen a nation called call a he. he. Right. That's another good catch. Yeah. That's a that's number three. See. Good catch, Mark. So again, looking at the false prophet, we'll be, be done here. Let's read the rest of the chapter. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Give breath to him. I don't know how that works. I don't know if that's some clone activity. I don't know if they're cooking something up in a lab or what they're doing. Who knows? It's really weird. I mean, uh, I think recently the Japanese, they had this line of robotics they came out with, and they they make them, they're, for more realistic vocalizations, they gave them lungs to where they could breathe and speak and things vibrate. It's, you know, they're weird about this kind of stuff, making them look really weird, and it's creepy. You know, they put a statue of this girl on the stage and turns around and talks and stuff, and they, it's like a... It's like a, a Disney animatronic from hell. I mean, it's really creepy. So what the false prophet will do, we don't know. We don't know. If, if he gives them, um, I don't know if they're saying, give a breath, give breath to the image of the beast. To me, that sounds like a form of life, not really living, but fake life. So I don't think it's just a hologram or something standing or an animatronic speaking. Somehow it's, uh, it's given some form of life. Um, even if it's pseudo. Also, it causes all, all, both small and great. Do you fit in that category? Are any of you in the middle of there, small and great? Rich and poor, you could be maybe in between. Free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. I'm trying to say just about everybody, folks, although there's some people who refuse, right? We know by the time we get to the end so that no one could buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is, your name, 
or, the, or your number? No. The name of the beast or the number of its name? This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number, not their number, not your number, is 666. But, again, to reiterate from Daniel 7, this final kingdom is what we're looking for about how Christ wins, and we'll end with this. You know, it's worth reading again, the glorious victory of, of Christ and the saints. Daniel 7, starting with verse 44, and in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. In other words, you're not going to die off and your heirs are going to uh, inherit it. It's not going to be left to anybody else. The kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, the one that took down Nebuchadnezzar's statue, and then it broke in pieces of uh, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is true. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. Questions? So remember when we just discussed Gog and Magog and the confusion and everybody fighting and squabbling over which nations are what and whatever, this kind of thing. I think this... Rome versus Babylon, Europe versus America versus the Middle East. It's the same type of squabble where we've got overlap that all has to do with trying to take over Jerusalem and trying to dominate Jerusalem because that's God's city, right? But either way, it's going to be, these are all kingdoms and they all have characteristics which are going to be true of the final, not Christ's kingdom, but the final earthly system of the Antichrist. And it's going to have that kind of reach, that kind of power of some of the different aspects of these different nations. Because it's going to be global. I hope I didn't confuse it all up for everybody. Okay. Let's close in prayer. Lord, again, thank you for your word. We pray for wisdom as we study your word. We look forward to chapter 14 because we know you're going to clarify some more and tell us a little bit more about what to expect in the in the final handful of years we're going to have um, some more perspective change of uh, what we're going to be seeing and how things are going to end up kind of a pre preview of how things are going to lead up to the end and we're looking forward to that and uh, we we pray for clarity we pray lord that you'll bring us all back safely next week and everybody who's gone uh, this evening whether traveling or illness or anything else bring them back next week uh, for the following weeks and Lord, we just enjoy your word, and uh, we pray that we continue to enjoy this fellowship together in your name. For it's in Christ's name that we do pray, give you thanks. Amen.